thank you for this opportunity for speaking about this topic. And I have, so today I'm gonna to talk about something about group cohomology uh, and uniformly bounded representation. Um, and it's not quite MCZ, but I hope everyone can enjoy it. So uh, please let me start. So let me begin with this uh, quite famous conjecture uh, by Shalom, which says that if you have a hyperbolic loop gamma, there's something wrong with this. The headphones are the problem. Uh, they exist uniformly bounded representation by on Hilbert space. That's too bad, it used to work. And for which there's a call cycle. BG in H1 GH, uh, which is proper. And so this is a conjecture and let me explain two things, which is not quite common terminology. So uniformly bounded representation, this means if you have a representation on a Hilbert space, I have a constant C such that the G applied to V is bounded by a constant times the normal V for any G for any V. So that's a uniformly bounded representation. Um, it's easy to see the unitary representation is uniformly bounded representation. And here proper call cycle means as usual, it satisfies a proper the co cycle condition. So it means pi G prime BG plus BG prime is equal to BG prime G. And, and this is same as saying, if you consider B maps to pi G B plus BG, this defines a group homomorphism into an affine group of transformations. And, and a proper means simply this call cycle, the normal call cycle on, of this Hilbert space goes infinity as G goes to infinity. And this is same as saying this associated affine action on the Hilbert space is metrically proper, which, which appeared in uh, John Child's talks. And um, so this is a conjecture and it's quite surprising if it's true. I mean, it's very interesting to know if this is true or not because many hyperbolic groups have Kazanon property T. So if you change this conjecture to un unitary representation, then this is uh, definitely false. And it's, it, it would be very interesting if this holds for all hyperbolic groups for uniformly bounded representation. So this is a conjecture as far as I know not so much is known, uh, but there's a result by, unpublished result by uh, yeah, Shalom again. So there's an unpublished result. Which says, If you take G to be the simple Lang one Lie group SPN1, then um, G admits such a cycle, such pi and BG. 
And this is unpublished result in the sense that as far as I know, not so many people know the construction, either its detail or even the construction of a Hilbert space and uniformly bounded representation. But as far as I know, this is well known to experts. And uh, I'm gonna try to uh, explain the construction and if I have time, a little bit about why this is proper uh, in this talk. So this is my goal here. Um, and again, for, so this implies that the lattice of the SPN1 is a hyperbolic group and they satisfy this conjecture. And it's again, G has Kazan property T, so this is very interesting. They cannot have a unitary representation such that proper uh, for which there is a proper Ranko cycle. Okay, so I see the time now that uh, I should not be too slow, but since I mentioned this conjecture, I should mention the two things. So the Gwali and you show that the, as a related result for gamma hyperbolic group, um, there exists a gamma, the number which is associated to gamma such that for any P greater than P gamma, gamma admits uh, a proper uncle cycle for LP space, not the uniformly bounded representation here, but space, but LP space. Um, this is quite a remarkable result. And related to this, um, there's other results by Bogdan Nika, which is, um, again, gamma same. Uh, there exists some constant again. This is a so-called hyperbolic dimension introduced by Minev, um, such that again, gamma admits proper Ranko cycle for isometric action on certain LP space of the boundary with respect to specific measure. So that's a very interesting result, which is related to this conjecture, but uh, I'm not gonna talk, although I said too much about the hyperbolic group, I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm gonna focus on this SPN1, including I'm gonna define SPN1 uh, for those uh, who don't know the definition. Okay, so let me begin. So the goal is this let box. I want to try to, uh, let everyone see what this co-cycle is and what the uniformly bounded representation of SPN1. Okay, so I want to define the regroup OQ. And for now, just for fun, I'm gonna let uh, F to be field, a uh, real number or complex or, um, Cotanians, and we define fn plus one to be a right f vector space. So, so the element here is I want to regard this as a column vectors n plus one element. So this is light f vector space. And we define the quadratic form associated to this vector space on the vector space, which is defined to be, I'm sorry, um, I will do it again. It's minus W zero conjugate and summation over usual inner product of from i equals one to n 
Okay, so here, of course, by conjugate, I mean A plus IB plus JC plus KD. Conjugate is A minus IB minus JC minus KD uh, in H. If it's complex number, this is usual conjugation. Okay, so this is quadrilateral form and all Q is defined to be the matrix which acts on this vector space by left modification, which preserves this form. So this is definitely a closed subgroup of a GRN. Uh, GR, not N, but GN, N plus one. Um, okay, so this is Uh, some group and S O N one. Just for the information, I'm going to define S O N one, S U N one, S P N one. So S O zero N one, which is a connected component of S O N one, is defined to be O Q, where field is R, and then you take a connected component of that. And let's assume N is greater than two. And uh, SUN1, this is defined to be OQ of complex numbers, but you should take a determinant equals one. And as for SPN1, today's main character, this is just OQ of uh, quotidians, and you don't have to take a determinant equals one. Uh, yeah, so these are the groups. And for now, let's G to be one of those, uh, one of those. Then we define K to be a maximal compact of G and you can take this to be a G intersection with isometric oh something is wrong isometries of f n plus one where isometry with respect to usual in the product and this would be a compact subgroup of G and uh, this is a maximal compact. So for your information, I'm gonna write the maximal compact here. So SON1 the maximal compact is this form. And SUN1 maximal compact is un u1 and then such that the determinant is one. And for spn1, it's just spn1 plus sp1. All right, so those are the maximal compact. And we define associated symmetric space G over K and it turns out that this is isomorphic, canonically isomorphic to disk of DN dimension where D is the dimension over R of F. So it can be one or two or four. Uh, let me just explain a little more about that. So. G over K, what this looks like, well, for G equals S O two one, then this is famous picture, you know, you have Minkowski space and you got the orbit of hyperbolic
a public paraboloid. And this is G over, this orbit is G over K. But for um, this, uh, because this is because the isometry group at this point zero, zero, 001 is K. Uh, but I just uh, warned that uh, for field, if the field is not real number, then this orbit in the vector space Fn plus one is not G over K. It's a little fatter than G over K because you have a unit is dimension greater than zero. And so the correct thing is you have to mod up by, by scalars. So if you define Pn to be the projective space associated to this vector space, then, sorry about that. Then among this subspace, so this is Fn plus one, remove zero and then divided by the scalar. Among this projective space, we have uh, Z such that the, this quadratic form value of quadratic form is negative. And you can regard this as in the projective coordinate It's the same as saying um, you have a Z0, Zn satisfying this uh, co uh, condition, but you, you can divide by Z0. So this is same as saying you have You have a space, so it's canonically identified. This space is canonically identified as a disk. So this is a disk of dimension dn. And it turns out that the g, of course, g acts on pn, and the g acts on this subspace because g preserves the quadratic form, so at least it preserves a sign. And it turns out that the action is transitive. So, and you can show that this is uh, G over K. So, so this is G over K. So this is G over K. Sorry about this. Oh, something happened. So this is the G over K. Not doing well, sorry. Um, other directions, but okay. So, anyway, my point is you have associated space G over K, it's just a disk, and then G is acting on it. So, let me call this G over K to be X. And as you see, G is acting on PN. So it's, the action is much bigger than X or, and this G action on the disk extends to the boundary. Which is the sphere of DN minus one dimension. So this is odd provided the scalar is uh, not real. And again, you have, I you have specific identification, which is Q, Z, Z equals zero. This is in PN. So we can write this action specifically because this is at the end of the day, GRN acting on projective space. So it's a fractional linear transformation, but I'm not gonna write it down because I'm not gonna use it. Okay, so this is the G action on the disk and it's and on its boundary. And let's take some, so just a picture again for, this is the origin of disk. So this is a G over K. 
which is x. On the outside, this is a sphere. And let's take some point here on the boundary, whatever. So it can be one, zero, zero, zero on the sphere. Then um, Well, so the fixed point group of G is called subgroup of uh, G, which is, which I write as P. And uh, if you are a representation theorist, this is a minimal parabolic subgroup. And as you see, G over P is sphere. It's compact. Okay, so this is very elementary but important discussion about SPN1, including more other examples. Now let me jump to Collins result on uniformly bounded representations. So let me begin by saying, so G is acting on G over P. Well, G over P is sphere. So you have standard amplification. And yeah, so this is, maybe I write this as, hmm. M, it's, it's not standard notation if, I, if I'm gonna do re-theory here, but I'm not gonna use M uh, for re-theory purpose. So let me denote this manifold to be M, standard notation. So I'm gonna first mention that unless F is R, so G is S O N one. If G is S U N one or S P N one, the G action on this space is not conformal, so tangent space action is not conformal. This is very important to know. Um, on the other hand, if F is R, then as you know, S O N one is a conformal group of a sphere. But there exists the G equivariant subwindle of TM such that For core dimension one, for f equals c, and core dimension three for f equals h, um, such that g action on E is conformal uh, with respect to standard Riemannian metric on S T n minus one, conformal, and action on the associated quotient is also conformal. So people say this is a quasi-conformal action. So the conformal factor on E and TM over E is different. On TM over E, the conformal factor, the power is uh, two times the, that, on, that on E. And one more important thing is this, this E is quite big. Um, in a sense that this vector field belong E, and then if you take a bracket, that's gonna generate all vector fields on M. So this is I forgot how you call it, but the vector field belonging to E generates the vector field on M. All right, so uh, let me quickly uh, explain what this E looks like. Um, although it's not gonna be a self-contained. Um, so T star M, this manifold M is 
canonically identify as um, new potent subalgebra of P, where P is the ideal algebra of P. This is just a remark. Please think this as a remark. But just in case, if you're curious, so T star M is identified as N, and then the action, so the T star of this fixed point, P. Remember, I, 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 I said sphere is, this sphere is the boundary of G over K, and then I picked the P to be some point here. And then P is the fixed point subgroup of GP. And then you take a real algebra of P, then the algebra of P contains some new potent subalgebra. In fact, this is a new potent radical. And then T star PM is canonically identified at N. Uh, for the time's sake, I just take this for granted. And the action and P on T star M, P is isotropy of G action on M. It's going to be identified as an adjoint action on N. And in fact, you can't put the metric which this makes to be unitary. So this kind of explains, not, sorry, not unitary, but the conformal. So this kind of explains it's, you can't put the metric which makes conformal action. But if you divide, um, and then TM, by the way, so TM is N star. But N contains a center. And N is a two-step new potent. So N divided by E is, you can make this to be a conformal. So this, you can make this to be conformal. And same way, if you take a sub, subspace of N star, which is the orthogonal complement of the center, which is canonically identified as N over E star. No. Uh, one second. Confused, I'm not gonna write it down. Um, then this corresponds to subspace E. So E corresponds to So some of the algebra things going on, but I just uh, want you to uh, see that there is a G equivariance of bundle on which G act on G, G action is conformal. That would be important later, not soon, but just I just mentioned because just because. Okay, but anyway, G is acting on M and let me consider the volume form on this sphere the standard volume on the sphere. And of course, if you map by G, which is, I mean, G inverse to star, then it's gonna be some cosine called multiplied by volume form. Because G acts in a sphere by orientation preserving map. C, G, Z is a positive cosine cycle. And This is a co-cycle. So let me define by, by CZZ. So that's a notation. And then let me, def let, let us consider the representation of Z on smooth functions on a sphere. So whenever I write the G over P, this is just a sphere. Um, so this is just a representation which maps F to G of F. By twisting the above con cycle, this cos cycle CZG, one can produce this kind of representation as well. And this is nothing but the represent, this is a 
naturally equivalent to uh, representation of G on the top degree form. You can send this F to F ball, F to ball in form. And the G is acting on the, the top degree form on G over P. Um, of course, this is just the action on top degree form in disguise. So now we have two representation G on some fresh space. But there are whole families of such a representation. So, in fact, we can consider, for example, GF times CGZ one over two. This is another representation, and this is isometry on L two. G over P, and let's use measure as a standard using standard volume form. Then you can show that this is a Hilbert space representation. So this is nothing but the principal series representation. Um, of a G. So this is unitary representation. Um, but if you think about it, we can do the same trick. one over p. If you do this, well, of course, p equals one, then we get the action on the, this one. And then if you set p equals infinity, you get the action on the smooth functions. And you, as, as you vary p, this representation varies. And then this is isometry on LP space. Again, using the standard volume form as a measure. So now we're getting close to the result of calling. So pi lambda f, let's define pi lambda f, which is a representation. So this is representation of g, g on smooth function, which is parameterized by lambda. And then I, we define this to be g of f c g z, and then I normalize it so that uh, statement becomes beautiful. So lambda over two. Here, one over two plus uh, lambda over two is related to one over p, if you like. So this whole family of representation parameterized by lambda. For now, lambda is valid for a complex number who is real now real component is between minus one to one. Then as I already explained, if P is chosen so that one over two plus lambda over two equals one over P, then this representation is naturally isometric representation on LP space, if you complete it. But surprising fact is the following. This is uh, from 1980s. So we have a strip of representation. So you have a complex plane and you have a region. This is one, this is minus one. And corresponding to each vertical line, you have a specific LP representation. So this is L infinity. This is L1 and then here L2. And somewhere here you have LP or value P as P varies. When lambda equals one, this recovers representation on the top degree form. And when lambda equals minus one, you recover representation on the smooth functions. Here you go. But Michael Colling theorem states that for 
lambda satisfying this condition. So it's inside the strip. Pi lambda is uniformly bounded representation. Uh, or with, with respect to Hilbert space norm, one plus Laplacian E alpha over two um, F and use some fixed k invariant volume form here again. So this is some norm. And here, so we got some Laplacian here. So here Laplacian E is sub Laplacian, k invariant sub Laplacian. associated to E. Remember E was a sub bundle of uh, TM, which whose vector field generates all vector fields. And so please think this as some kind of Sobolev space where now Laplacian is replaced to some sub, -la sub Laplacian. And here alpha is specific component, which is not going to be important my, in my talk, but it's important to state correctly. Alpha equals some number associated to lambda, and then R depends on the field. N minus one for F equals R, um, two N for R equals C, F equals C, and four N plus two. And it's important that this is the optimal possible. You have a parameter lambda. If you, if you go, if you change lambda to be outside of this strip, you can show this cannot be uniformly bounded. So this result is optimal and it's in fact, very amazing result. Um, I'm just gonna quickly mention uh, for the self-containment, self this sub, -la sub Laplacian is you can define in other folk way in this way. So consider the DE, which is omega zero, the smooth function mapped by D, drum differential to one form. And then one form is defined on a tangent space TM, but you can restrict to this sub bundle. So map to this section of E star, because it's a form defined on E. Then of course, using K in biometric, this space has a canonical L2 metric. So you can define DE star. So DE star with respect to that, that's gonna be the definition of sub Laplacian. And one remark is for F equals R, sub bundle is uh, e, e equals equal to TM. So what this theorem says is that you can use one plus Laplacian, the standard Laplacian in the sphere, and then you have some um, this this is the this is a metric. And this is nothing but the Sobolev space, usual Sobolev space on the sphere. So the point is Michael Collins theorem states that you have param parameterized family of representation pi lambda of G on the smooth functions on each of which you have a canonical LP space for which G is acting isometrically. But in fact, you can make that representation to be uniformly bounded representation on the Hilbert space, which is completely non-trivial. Okay, I should quickly mention two remarks because it's interesting, I think, so I'll remark anyway. So 
SPN1 has Kazan property T. This is the result by constant in 1960s. So in other words, the trivial representation is isolated in the space of representation. And um, recall you have a vertical strip of lambda space and then you have one here minus one. And here you have a canonical principal series representation. This is L2 already a unitary representation. And in here I said, you have the top, um, top degree form here. And here representation is just a representation on G over P. Um, I can take uh, it either, but let, let me take this one. So consider this representation G on C infinity space, the usual no call cycle. Then you have a representation which is sub-representation, which is just a trivial representation. So this is one G inside C infinity G over P because G over P is compact. So as you see, here you have a trivial representation as a sub, as a sub. But what Michael Collins theorem states is that this whole strip is uniformly bounded. In other words, as for SPN1, you can approach isol um, trivial representations through uniformly bounded representation. And if you restrict to unitary representation, I'm gonna write in pink, you can always go somewhere which is complementary series, but you have to stop somewhere. So this is a complementary series. This is a unitarizable. This is one remark. And related to that, I, sh I, sh I should also mention um, the PL joke uh, attempts solving the Baumkorn conjecture with coefficients for SPN1 uh, using this homotopy. of uniformly bounded representation. So those are the two remarks. Okay, so we have 15 minutes left, so I think I can go on and talk about group cohomology. So, let me go on. So I told you about the uh, Michael Collins results about this strip, but the question is what happens at lambda equals plus minus one? So at the edge of this strip, so lambda equals one corresponds to a top degree form. And then here you have uh, the functions. And here you have a canonical isometric action on L1 space and L infinity space. Well, the first of all, they cannot be uniformly bounded. I already said that, but let me just write down what's going on. So lambda equals minus one. Then you got this sequence of representation. Um, divide by constant function, you get some vectors, the representation, W0. And for lambda equals one, which is contra gradient, or dual of this,
And this map is just the integral of a volume form. Um, and here, as you see, the canonically, this W is isomorphic to the top degree form whose integral is zero. Okay. And the proposition, which I was hoping to explain a little bit, but although I should focus on other things. So proposition is this W zero, the quotient. I already said that C infinity G over P, you can't make it uniformly bounded. At, this is at the edge of the strip of callings. But W zero, the quotient, this is a proposition. W zero is uniformly bounded. And this follows for a more general result of Michael Collin. Where more general, I mean, I was only talking about the one one family of representation, which is so-called spherical series representation, but there are many other principal series representation of SPN1, and each of which has parameter like this, parameter lambda like this, and then you have an analogous result. And if you apply such a result here, you can show that W0 is uniformly bounded. Um, So W0, the quotient is again uniformly boundable. It's a quotient of a smooth function divided by the constant. And uh, the norm is again, look like a solverless space norm, appropriate power. And uh, hence, W is a dual of W0. So W0 is this divided by the constant function. So the corollary is W, which is dual, is uniformly boundable. Which again, the norm can be described using the sub Laplacian. So my whole point is you have this extension and then W is uniformly boundable for some specific Hilbert space norm. Now here comes the group cohomology stuff. So you have this extension. And you can quite easily show this extension is non-trivial in a sense of the X theory. In fact, if you want to split this sequence, you have to find the invariant sub of a uh, the top degree form, which is same as saying, you have to find a G equivalent top degree form, which is impossible. In fact, already K invariant uh, top degree form is uniquely determined up the scalar, and then they are not G invariant. So this extension is non-trivial. So this defines non-trivial Wanko cycle. So if you know the extension of such extension and the group called cycle BG is one-to-one -one correspondence where you can define, for example, BG to be G times volume for minus, maybe other way around, it's better, the volume form of sphere minus G volume form of sphere. And this is easily, this is easy to see. So on, again, I'm gonna write this again. This is the dig, top degree form on the sphere whose integral is zero. And this is easy to see. This is non-trivial co cycle in a sense that the associated class in the group cohomology is non-zero just because this extension is non-trivial. 
And in fact, there's an abstract theorem that the such cycle for SPN1 must be proper, but I'm not going to use that. Um, let me uh, state the theorem. Um, BG, this BG is a proper cycle. cycle. So, in other words, G, the G is SPN, SPN1 or SGN1 or SLN1. For us, SPN1 is our interest. SPN1 acting on the top degree form on the sphere, the boundary of G over K, uh, whose integral is zero. There's a canonical action. The one W is uniformly boundable. Using Collins result. And then secondly, you consider the call cycle, which is just this volume form and then subtract by G multiply by volume form. And that's gonna sit inside W. So this is a boundary inside, of course, omega top, but it's not boundary in W. And this is a proper. And so G are the mates uh, on a Hilbert space. Uh, proper affine action for the linear part is uniformly bounded. And it follows that, uh, so, Thus, for example, gamma inside the G lattice satisfies the Shalom's conjecture. Um, just before I finish, let me remark uh, this co cycle. I should mention this. So, this co cycle BG. on the top degree form whose integral is zero was considered by P.L. Duke again for showing um, SO0 N1 and then SU N1 are AT minable. This is also quite old result. So he in fact showed that this pro this cycle cycle with respect to some Hilbert space norm is proper, and then he also showed that that action in the case of S O N one H U N one is unitary representation. And this is uh, oh, it's not loading yet. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yes, I think it's now loading. I think I should stop. Uh, I was going to mention some other interesting stuff, but I think I will take a question instead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments? Oh, actually, I have uh, lots of questions. <laughs> OK. Uh, yes, so I have a few. So first one is that. Uh, uh, all the examples you mentioned are all real rank one. Uh, how does this real rank uh, play a role here? Can you send it to a real rank case? So first of all, the, for, right. So for higher rank, real rank Lie group, you cannot expect to have a uh, extension like this where W is uniformly boundable. This is a result by in written in some group cohomology books, uh -huh. like Wallach's or Bolel. And so if you want to find an interesting call cycle for higher rank group, you have to go higher extension. So H2, higher, H2. Higher, higher, yes, right, yes. Yeah. And in fact, That's, you can show- um, what I ex expect, yeah. Yes, so there might be some interesting result. In fact, my expectation is that's going to play a role in Blancon conjecture and so on, but I, I have no okay, uh -huh. more comments on that. Yes, okay. But so for real uh, life, Actually, that's my guess. Yeah. Yes, thank you. 
Oh, thank you. We, yes, I, 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 that's, uh, I think uh, uh, that's my guess, this, uh, because it's real rank one, so it's a group one code cycle. And if you higher rank, maybe you have to go something higher. And uh, another question is that uh, for even for the case of SPN1, I remember in, um, uh, for SPN1, there's uh, uh, some series called uh, isolated series representation, which I don't understand. Does it sit inside in the strip? Uh, yes, isolate, um, yes, some isolated series representation is inside a strip. Although, of course, they are not spherical series representation, but no, okay, the, uh -huh. some other, you use some representation of P, the parabolic subgroup. There's some uh -huh. isolated series in a sense uh -huh. that it's, it's isolated in, a, in the unitary representation. And then, in fact, you can show that that's representation. Some of them are not isolated in uniform redundant representation. Ah, uh, okay. I see. I, I see. And uh, uh, another question is that uh, uh, actually uh, with Xiang, we construct some uh, cyclical cycles for Schwarz algebra of G. But now in your case, you consider not tempered, not unitary, but it's a larger class of uh, representations. But uh, uh, in the work with the Xiang, our construction, uh, so of course, uh, it's very subtle to uh, worry about what algebra we are going to work with. If we want to uh, uh, fit the, the work you described, we should definitely go beyond the Schwarz al algebra of G, but go to some, some other uh, functionality, which I don't know yet. Maybe it has something to do with the norm in, uh, you introduced. But uh, there, but the construction to construct some uh, cyclic uh, uh, co-cycle condition, where all we need is just this parabolic group P with uh, this Iwasawa decomposition. So I will guess, I, I don't know if it is possible to apply our construction uh, to this case, but to work with a more larger, uh, uh, bigger, algebra and uh, what is their relation? Uh, I don't know right. if you have to uh, think about this, but, uh, but I, I think it's, uh, it's possible. Right, I think that's very interesting comment. I uh -huh. have uh, no idea on that yet though. Okay, I maybe we can discuss uh, later on. And the last question is that uh, uh, for the uniform bounded representation, what can you say about this uh, matrix, matrix coefficient? Oh, so there's a well-known result that if it's irreducible representation of uniformly bounded representation, then it must be, um, well, okay, finite matrix coefficient is LP for some P. Um, uh, oh, so you say the matrix coefficient is always in LP? LP for some P, right. as far as I understand. And LP. Sorry if I'm wrong, I can search that. Okay. There's I some see, results see. like that also. There's several results uh -huh. relating to some leading coefficients of, a, of the representation. Okay. Uh -huh. But I'm not an expert on that, so I will refrain uh -huh. saying so much. Certainly, oh, yeah. these the particular ones, uh -huh. Uh -huh. They're, they're in LP. Right, uh, right. Okay. Uh -huh. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Hey, do I have other questions or comments, suggestions? Okay, let's thank Shintaro again for a beautiful talk. Thank you. Thank you.